Let's rehearse. <laughs> okay? Yeah. All right. So we're talking here about not one thing, but two. Two in a little box, right? But, uh, but trying to escape from it. That's what we've been trying to do. Uh, I'll start with the two, though. It's always better to start with two than with one. And uh, in my mind, the, the event itself, the conference, was, was a shock. It was like the, the earthquake. It changed my life. It changed the direction semiotics was going to take. It was a, an entirely different panorama afterward. That's why I thought, always thought it was so very important to bring it back. But I wasn't sure exactly that my own feeling towards it uh, were, were confirmed, would be confirmed by your readership. That's why uh, um, it, it took so long, right? But uh, at the same time, um, you know, the, the schizo culture issue was, was probably one of the most happiest, the, the happiest moments, right? Uh, we are not like fighting each other as we did in the, in the conference and trying to, uh, to put a fragment uh, together in a way that would be compatible. You know, the, the, there was not enough ju juxtaposition. There is too many attempts to summarize things, to put, pull things together, to, to see what meaning was there, and uh, people fought it out, right? The schizo culture was different. Uh, we were already uh, away from academe, right? Uh, the, the conference what happened at Columbia, but it was my rupture with academe, basically, you know, two or three years after I joined Columbia. So it was a shock. And, uh, and the schizo culture is something else because somehow we, we move towards the art world, I say towards the art world, because the art world seemed to be more about French theory than they, the artists themselves realized. And that's, that's exactly what happened. And the intuition I had from the beginning is that what was so creative in France was not art, it was philosophy. And basically the philosophy that they came about with uh, was so close to what I was discovering in New York. You know, when, uh, when the conference happened, I, was, I hardly lived in New York yet, just a year or so. And I was, I was aware of Burroughs because he was in exile. I was aware of uh, um, uh, Jake C John Cage because uh, I discovered his book in France, a book that was never translated in English. So it was mostly my, upbring, my, my European upbringing that brought me to, uh, to try to pull things together. Uh, the schedule culture issue, it was there. It was, it was fun because there was no need to fragment. There was no need to transgress. Uh, everything was side by side. Everything was kind of reasoning with, resonating with each other. And somehow, we didn't exactly know what it meant, but the, the meaning was in process, right? Uh, it was experimental in the sense that we didn't know exactly what would come out of it. But uh, there was so much energy and so much uh, freedom in doing it that uh, we trusted that it, it's something that would work. Right? And also we had a, 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 this new community was a very small community and it was good to feel, uh, to feel part of it at the time. And I guess that's uh, the only time that uh, Semiotex got, ever got so close to the art world. But the art world is not the same as we have now and I'm not uh, recriminating. I'm just saying that uh, looking back, and that's one of the purposes, I think, to, uh, to, to look at the magazine, look, looking back, we know where we could have come from, but we didn't. You know? there, was a, there was a possibility, there was a, some sort of a creative anarchy that was uh, being uh, you know, discussed and, and, uh, and uh, you know, performed during the, during the, the convention or the, the conference. That, that didn't, didn't go exactly where we were hoping to go. But it existed, it's a time, it's a time where New York was the world. You know, New York was, a, was this kind of half of destroyed city and things were happening just because we, we had no way, no way out of it. And we didn't want to go out, we were there and we wanted to, go, to, to be in New York. And New York was a real place where you felt there was so much uh, energy that uh, you know, things were happening. When I talk about schizo culture, it's a culture of New York I had in mind. Not just a culture of New York, but New York was the epitome of a city where things could happen. It's not the only one, it didn't last, but it wasn't meant to last. But I was still hoping, and I'm still hoping, that there's something there that it was a new departure. It was like sprouting in one direction which we, we didn't imagine would stop. You know, That's the worst about it is that we are so 
So it was so joyful to be there and to work together and to put this issue together that there was so much good energy that uh, we wouldn't imagine that uh, five, six, seven years later it would like be, be it would like crash, crash with the start of. Uh, of uh, the real estate uh, coup, the, the rescaping New York from uh, from uh, the sorry state it was, they, they, you know, it's like changing 42nd Street into a into a Whitney, uh, to a, uh, uh, a, Whitney, uh, a Disneyland, right? There was no Disneyland there. What uh, 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 42nd Street was uh, where the weird things are happening, and there was no repulsion towards this. Uh, America hated New York. You know, didn't want to come there, were afraid to be there. It was a very special moment, a moment where a limited number of people were together. They were not all together. There was, a, there was a, the art world, the old art world, art world, and there was the punks coming up, and there was a, the young radicals. And basically, without even thinking, these were all our people, right? And we tried to encompass them including some young academics, you know, I'm nothing against academia because I live my life there. But academia, you know, it was too, too much the prison we are trying to, to, to get out of and, and that we show in the magazine. You know, it's, it's another mental hospital, in the mental, mental uh, uh, you know, place. But it was not exactly the place to go, but it was okay. If you mixed it with something else, you, if, if all this world coexisted and something came out of it, and basically that was what, what, what the issue was. The issue was an after, aftershock to the event, but then it was already something else, and we are hoping to go on, and that's why at the back of the issue we put uh, schizo culture number two, because we are so full of things that uh, were, it was already possible to predict what we were going to do. And then the issue solved very fast. And then I thought, well, you know, I'm in America, not just in New York. You can't go have a sequel, you know. <laughs> you, you do your thing, and then you switch off and do something else. So we jumped to number two, and we did something else, more political, because at that time, the only politics that uh, the art world had was very spectacularly uh, uh, terroristic. But it didn't, it didn't exist in their life. It existed in some sort of fantasy. So we switched to something else. And it, I realized it was very important that switching is essential. And in New York, you didn't have a choice. In New York, we are always looking in, in front of ourselves and at the back, right? We always have to be ahead of ourselves in, in order to know what to do. That's what uh, Phil Glass in, uh, in the issue calls being experimental. Not experimental in the sense that you don't know what you're doing, but experimental in the sense that you, you throw something and then you see what happens and see if you can do something with it. And that's what happened with semiotext. We did have no idea it was going to be semiotext. It was just like an issue. Um, but um, I don't know. The, the conference is very political, though. I mean, there's all the um, mm -hmm. Judy Clark, uh, who um, is in jail, um, mm -hmm. was part of the weather underground. Mm -hmm. um, in the panel, if you read the the panel in prison about prison and the way that she talks about Colombia then and at the time and um, it's very people are trying to deal with this real political issue mm. about psychiatry and, and and imprisonment and like control so yeah these were really yeah. political issues yeah. no but I mean even the the conference yeah. still had a very yeah, the, uh, actually, the, this is what I rediscovered when I, when I had to write the, the forward, the introduction. Because when I arrived at Colladia in 72, in 72 uh, all the 60s had disappeared. And there was nothing like to say, oh, this is Colombia, this is where uh, May 68 started. No one wanted to talk about it. No one wanted to, take risk, to claim anything from it. The, the university had kind of closed down and was uh, very f frightful of making any, any move because a move could just trigger something. It was mined. But I had rediscovered that when I, I looked at the issue recently. I, I suddenly followed up a few tracks. I went to see Judy Clark. I, I corresponded with, uh, with uh, uh, Tigress Atkinson. Uh, uh, you know, I, I started realizing that, yes, it was there. If you scratch a little bit, it is all over the place there. But we were, uh, at that time, in a, in, a, in, a, in a denial. Denial about Vietnam, denial about those who were trying to change the situation there and here. 
you know. So it had been covered up, and, and repression or denial is not exactly uh, the, the kind of uh, force that or energy we want to be with. But uh, the, the, the issue brought it up, and I was amazed when, when I reread that, how, how much it was there, and I didn't quite see it, you know. Uh, but it was there. And there was many things that are there, and I, I, I may not have seen, seen them either. The problem is that you never know exactly what you do. You, know, you, you, you create a mechanism that's going to uh, incorporate much more, much differently, much different thing than you expect, and that's good. And you could say it's the same as reading the issue now. Uh, the issue now, you know, we know, you know all these people who are interviewed uh, in the magazine. It was from your shop to discover these people. I thought, oh, they, they're so, so disconnected from the reality uh, in France of, uh, of theory. And then they were working exactly along the same line, right? And it was a shock because also it said, it, it, it taught me that you can really uh, come up with philosophy without coming up with theory, you know, not fetishizing the language. You can do things without the language and with the language. You can, like John Cage, he, he was dealing with empty words, uh, the, the, um, uh, Deleuze, uh, didn't know a word of English, but he, he, he speaks, he spoke slowly as if, if he spoke slowly, people would understand better, and he put some graphs on the, on, on the blackboard. You know, you do with what we have, you know? You don't have to go through the master language. And unfortunately, what happened is that what was so free, so open-ended, so, so full of uh, uh, hope for the future, you know, got grabbed and, and, and put into the very same kind of prison that we were trying to escape. And that, that's exactly what, uh, what happened. We then had to find politics somewhere else where politics was. Um, yeah, I wanted to, to talk about that a little bit. Um, so some of the strategies that were done at that conference, for example, Guattari, who dissolved the panel that he was at because it was a position of power to be like us in front of other people who aren't speaking and because it meant that they had prepared something and that they had knowledge and that they were gonna transmit something. And so he began, um, I guess it was like the second day and some people got pissed um, so it was a panel of three people, and it split up into different sections. Right. Some people went on one side, and then actually a couple panelists wanted to read there. Um, it was good. So that was one strategy. Um, there were a lot of different strategies, I guess, at this conference. So maybe yeah, you can talk, talk about, about that, what yes. the different ones were. Well, these, these were not really strategies. Strategies mean that you think in advance. And mm -hmm. everything happened in three days, and we are totally unprepared. <laughs> we're just back from France. We just had met these people. There was no money. Uh, students, a few students were helping. And we expected 50 people to come. Yeah, we expected 50 people to come, which is usually the ratio of, a, of an academic conference. And then for a number of reasons, we came up with a thousand people every night. And uh, we, we didn't know how to handle it in a sense, you know, and I knew some, I didn't know some. Uh, uh, so it was a, a chaos, a, a creative chaos, right? But then when you look at it, it was, it was, it was good that there was things that were separate and didn't fit together. You know, usually you have like, like radical academics uh, talking to themselves, you know, having socialist conference, or, you know, they can, they, they can put on their curriculum vitae, you know, and, uh, and then well, the artists who don't read theory were very anti-intellectual at the time, you know, very, very opposed to any sort of uh, language that they didn't, they didn't understand, right? And there was a there was a punk, and then there was a the the, the schizo who were liberated, uh, who had uh, who had been called to come over the radio to come to the conference by Jean-Jacques Lebel and, and, and set up their own outfit and their own. It was it was impossible to to have uh, anything any order, and uh, Guattari just understood it. You know, he's an old Trotskyite, and he he wasn't you know he he, he perceived the contradiction of having all these people in, a, in an academic hall. You know? And on top of that, a, a, a place where May 68 has started, right? And for the French, it represents something, I guess, more than the Americans. It was like such a break, 
you know, it was, uh, for me, uh, the, the Schizo Culture Conference was during the 68, you know, like in 72, you know, in 75, right? So there was something very, uh, very bracing about the fact that you, yes, uh, people clash because people always try to, to, to understand, to dial, to enter into a dialogue, to find who is right, who is wrong, to critique, etc. And it was impossible to do that in, in, in that context. In that context, you had a clash between various constituencies. Some people came because they thought it was a, a conference in semiotics because the title was sem semiotext, right? Other people thought that it was a, you know, it was something about, uh, about madness, which it was, but it was madness, but uh, free madness, you know, finding a way out of madness, find, finding a way out of the hospital. It was not meant to be uh, closed off in a, in a conference hall. That's why it is good that he started with academe because that's, that, that was the end of it, right? Uh, we had to find a, a, university, a university without walls, you know, and we had to find uh, people who are thinking in an intellectual way without using an intellectual language and, then, and without fetishizing it, which unfortunately it was happened with French theory during the 80s and 90s. Not that I condemn en bloc everything that was done, but our idea was that to use thinking to get out of, to get out of things, of, of the boxes, right? And people just uh, grab theory in order to be back in the box and have, you know, on, on their lap or something to do with it, some, some prestige, some, some power over the others who couldn't understand. It became like too dialectical, you know? And if you look at who was performing at the time, you know, uh, was uh, Merce Cunningham dialectical? No, he was trying to break up the narrative, right? Uh, Phil Glass was trying to break up the narrative. Everyone was trying to get away from these dialectics, but since they were not philosophers, they were not talking about it, they were just doing it. And the French were basically the one who, had, who happened to have a, a philosophical language that, was, that could anticipate that and that could connect to it. And that's really what, uh, what it was about, establish a connection, you know, because the connection had been made. It was made, um, by around Derrida in 1966, but it was meant for academe. You, I didn't want to, 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 to revolutionize academe. It was tried in the 68, it didn't work. Uh, we, have to, we had to create silent, you know, slow growth revolution, something that would never explode, something that would constantly recharge with, by adhering to, adhering to a certain situation, you know, and coming out of it and making the most of it. I thought Americans were pragmatic, you know, but we didn't talk about the same pragmatism. You know, the French had a pragmatism, a bit like I said about, uh, about Firlas. Pragmatism is, uh, you know, try out, you know, uh, with having a certain idea in mind, and you can change it along the way. Same, same way we changed it and didn't do another issue of semiotics, but try to disappoint most people by doing something totally political that they didn't know about, you know. We realized that in order to be, to be a, Working in, in, the st in New York at the time, you constantly have two feet, two or three feet away from, from anyone else because uh, you have to also to learn how to keep things moving. And I think that may be a bit what we did with Semiotech. So we, we, have, we have a line, but it's not an ideological line. We, we keep constantly reforming it and displacing it, and we keep moving. You know? And if the world uh, is moving too fast, it's because moving has become a bad word too because it's a way of uh, encompassing, globalizing, pulling together, identifying things to each other, uh, annihilating all differences and all singularity. You know, we got too much of that. So there's different kind of, of, of movement. You know, there's a movement liberate, that's a movement we can close you so that you have like uh, cell phones and computer and all that and you are controlled from everywhere and you don't have the time to have a life. So that's not exactly what you wanted not to be at the table, but to get out. And that was that, but to get out, you know, I'll stop there. Deleuze has a, has a sentence that's very important for me. He said, he was talking about himself, and he said, you have to, I try, I'm trying to get out of philosophy, but as a philosopher, right? So that's, you know, that's the same goes, you know. You could maybe be an artist, but, you know, remember, re, re, remain an artist. Uh, when you move to, to the art world. And what happened that the art world became, took the place of the artist. We may have to relearn what art could be because it's already made for us.
Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess I want to continue with this question, which is um, these strategies of explosion, of um, breaking, so schizo, if I understand it's breaking something, um, maybe I'll read from here. Um, breaking strict, uh, structures of power, you know, so um, schizo does not refer here to any clinical entity, but to the process by which social controls of all kinds, endlessly reimposed by capitalism, are broken up and open to revolutionary change. So there's this idea of that strategy of yeah. breaking up yeah. and a refusal of certain kind of fear that forces us into whatever structure or institution um, that we find meaning in or that we find some security in or even you know economic security. Do you think that that I mean, it's interesting to think about this today after um, 40 years mm. um, where institutions have hardened, mm. um, economic violence has gotten even worse. I mean, the New York situation in 75 is a really um, instructive place to try to do this, mm. and it has some resemblance to our situation today, but what do you think about that um, strategy of explosion of, stru of structures. I mean, maybe today what we want, I don't know if like we're all so scared that we need to get you know, specialized in order to be able to enter into an institution. That's a w w even worse form of this, but well, is I, this I, still I'm, a strategy that you I, think? I'm not so much in, in favor of explosions. Happen. There's enough mm -hmm. explosions and not very good ones. Mm -hmm. I think that, I, I believe more in displacing things uh, to, you know, Moving, moving slowly or keeping things, keep, keeping one foot in different places, making always sure that you never belong, quite belong anywhere. You know, that that's a most, uh, it, it takes more time to explode, but you don't have to explode. It's a process of constantly, you know, moving, moving things around so that you're not, never contained in one box. You know, that's why I was starting with saying two boxes are better, but no boxes are, are, are best, right? <laughs> But you can't do that. You always have to be somewhere. So it, it, the strategy is always to, to see how far you can go in one direction. You know, it's like after schizo culture, I realized that uh, when everyone was so crazy about it, I realized that it, there's a danger there. You know, we're going to be like uh, absorbed by it. That's why you have to cut it. You have to cut it even, you have to force you to cut things when they go too well. Because then you just repeat it, right? So constantly you, you have to evaluate and that's why I find Nietzsche, who was behind all the French philosophers, but also behind the, behind the cage, for instance, right? Uh, that you, you have to evaluate the situation. Theory is not to, to, there to talk about, but you have to look in the situation you're in, in the situation where the world you live in, you have to constantly see you know, what you can do in order to, to, to move things a little bit, not to make them explode, because the explosion, that's it. You, know, you explode, and then what? You know? You know? Then you call the police. You know, but if you do that, you know, you, you know the, this, uh, this uh, Bartleby, Bartleby, right? The idea that you'd rather not do the same thing, right? You'd rather not explode, you know, but be on the path where the explosion would be, would be possible. But you don't have to make the ex explosion. Uh, Burroughs talks about the revolution. No one talks about the revolution now, but the, the poor class is much, much bigger than it has ever been. But we don't have classes anymore, so we don't fight. We are being made to turn, to, to turn into individuals so that we, everyone would be responsible for their debts uh, individually. We don't come put together. You know, there, there's no explosion because the, the whole system makes it such that no explosion would be possible. That's what happened in France after 68. It's a close down you know, and introduce a neoliberalism so that we're all free to die but not very, in a very interesting way, to die a, a, along, along the, the, the way that the, the system wants us to die. Uh, and I think well, what, we, what, what we talk about explosion is like, this is a, a, everyone is living a, a certain life. Mm. And they want, they want us to, to be patterned on, on, on that life. I mean, Phil Glass talked about it. He said, so they want music to be like a, like a human life. There's the beginning and then the end. No, of course there is a beginning, but how far is the beginning? How far is the end? You know, and lots of things happen in between. And you don't want to be dead before, you, before your time. And you don't want to be dead unless you're made of this 
life something else than a life that's predictable, that's calculable, that, you know, that's being imposed on you because you have to borrow money from the government or from this and that. Uh, the whole, what we call the, the, the system, is constantly to prevent us from, make, from having initiative, from evaluating the situation, from taking chances, from risking your life if need be. It's better to risk your life than, than risk, your, risk to be dead all the time, right? So that, that's, that's what I think uh, uh, we want to do. No one talks about revolution. It doesn't mean that revolution is not necessary. It just means that we have old patterns for revolution. You know, and Deleuze came up with something called the becoming revolutionary. It means that every day you have to you have to act in a way that would lead somewhere that uh, that no one else would uh, want you to do. You have to invent your life and you have to invent strategies according to the context in which you are. Const but constantly you have, and, and I think that that's what I was very conscious to do with semiotics. That constantly I was trying to avoid the group to, to become like too possessive or too conflictual. So I split the group, if you want, in this and that, so that people would just not waste their time trying to dialogue with each other, but be on their best energy to do something, not turning against each other, right? And that's why constantly we change the people we worked with, the Italian, the German, the, you know, uh, people in, 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 in New York, people outside, constantly we were trying to move things around in ways that are not uh, transgressive, because transgressing the best way for you to, to have someone with, a, with, a, with a, a stick behind you. You don't need to make a gesture. You know, I, at one point I was, a, because I was a bit ostracized from university, I thought I had to be the rebel. And then I realized, fuck it, who wants a rebel in, in the academe? You know, you might as well not be a rebel, but, you know, and not be in academe and do something else. Constantly we have to evaluate, you know, that's what the strategy is. We're responsible for our intelligence of the situation. It's a, it's a war, it's not an explosion. Our life is at war. The whole society is at war against us, against you if you want to make art, to turn your art into something else than it could have been, right? So constantly you have to reclaim your life and your work and etc. Reclaim because if you let let it happen for you, it's not what you would want to have. Yeah? How do you want to ask something? Uh, no, but um, I think this is a good time to um, to watch the film. It's dark enough. Yes. Oh. Uh, and Jack Smith, you can't have better better example of someone who had no idea about French theory, no idea about philosophy, but he speaks exactly the same. You know. He comes exactly on the same line as whatever, whatever we, we deal with. Cathy Garcia is going to introduce the Jack Smith movie. Um, hi, everyone. So I wanted to preface the movie with a little anecdote or a little talking about Jack. Um, Jack was a socialist born in capitalist times. And in the interview with Silver, you can tell this because he wrestles with the idea of authority. He wrestles with the idea of property ownership. He wrestles with the idea of Hollywood, and he wrestles with the idea of language. Um, and the one thing that Jack doesn't wrestle with is the idea of sharing. So I'd like to share this quote with you um, from Schizoculture. Silver asks Jack, what do you mean by a socialistic idea? Jack responds, to me, socialism is to try and find social ways of sharing. That's all and to replace the dependence upon authority with the principle of sharing, because it's very likely that there would be much more for everybody, thousands and more times for everybody, if things were shared. We're living like dogs from all the competing. And with that, we'd like to share with you Jungle Island from 1967. So I hope, I hope we didn't clarify we make it more obscure. <laughs> That's more to discuss. Yeah? Ah. Ah. Uh, it's up for grab. Well, that's Jack. Just Jack. Yeah. 
No, I haven't seen it before either. Yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, oh yeah. It's such a total film of obsession. Yeah. Yeah, he changed my life. <laughs> yes, he said, you know, uh, you are, you are. I think, uh, uh, you have an artistic mind, but forget about the language. <laughs> it is a thought that counts. You know? That's what he said. That's in the interview. The, the interview, the interview is in here. The, the interview is in oh. Schizo Culture, oh. and we also uh, released it as a as a record, um, only because Jack Smith, well, not only the text is amazing, but also his voice is um, pretty amazing. So um, it's, that's the record that's here. Yeah, once you've heard it, I Yeah. Well, I mean, as I said earlier, uh, he, he, you know, he, he, had, he, he had a vision that was right, if I say. You know, it, it, you have to have a perception. It doesn't matter if you fiddle around. If your perception is wrong, then you're going to come with something wrong. But he, he was perfect pitch. You know, with uh, whatever, I mean, this is the only, I'm, I'm glad I did this interview because otherwise we would never know. You know, because we have this film, but he, he never, he never kind of expressed, you know, his whole philosophy. And he has a, a great philosophy, but it is so, immediate, so simple, so far-reaching. I mean, when he said, I always remember, whenever I put my shoes on, I remember he said, you know, uh, when, when, you, when, you, when you buy a pair of shoes, you don't go to the cobbler uh, every month in order to pay for them, you know? So, it, so why do we, how we are we indebted that constantly we have to come up with the same thing? You know, why, why you buy your shoes? You use your shoes. You don't have to pay for it. The same for apartment or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So he has this very. He said, you know, yeah, it's it's when I talked to a, a man called Ian Foster, who is an English uh, an English writer and a friend of Virginia Woolf, uh, and he was he was a uh, Virginia Woolf said of him, Do you know, he says the, the simple things that people don't say, right? And he doesn't have to say things that are not simple because they're already so right on target that everything he said rings, rings true. You know? It's already there. It's already there. Get out of the right. And that, that's, again, that, that's what I, I got from, uh, from Nietzsche. You know? Nietzsche is a, is a dancing philosopher. It doesn't mean that you have to dance. But it means that constantly you have to readjust your position in relation to what uh, Nietzsche says. You know? Because Nietzsche doesn't ask you to understand something. He, he wants to help you find the right position from which you're going to see things. Then if you see things from this position, your, the, your perception is right. Right in the sense that it is, it is right on target and it can bring you something that uh, you don't need to be complex or complicated about. Philosophy is very simple if you take the right position in relation to it, but the position is constantly changing. There's all these priests and erotic and all that who want us to identify with them and take their position. So you can, you can understand that their perception is not something that you might you know, uh, accept for you. It's all a matter of where do you stand in relation to, in relation to the world. And Jack Smith had a, had a perfectly uh, right position in relation to the world. I may write because there's no wrong. But he didn't have to go beyond this kind of simplicity that is so, uh, so devastating. He was right there constantly. And I think that would be maybe what an artist has to be. The artist is not only an artist because he produces an object that's right, but because he has the kind of perception that allows him or her to, to, to be direct in relation to it. It doesn't have even need two curators to know, you know what art is about. If, if, if you are right in relation to, to, to the world and to the object, then this is, you don't need any interpretation, and they, you don't need any comments, you don't need any critique. You, know? you have to find the position that is right, and then all this will disappear as paraphernalia. paraphernalia you know? 
And that, that's also what Jack Smith taught. You know, he taught me, you don't need to express your opinion about things. The world can do without your opinion. But what, what, what you are looking at is what matters. And you have to connect to it in a creative way. That's all. So all the, but you say that and it means like a part of the university, part of all the art world falls apart. Because everything goes through indirect uh, commentaries and things that have to be like a, as obscure as a, as a work is supposed to be in order not to be committed. It's all about fear. And, uh, and the schizo culture means that. The schizo is not someone who is afraid because he's, he's, he's like dealing with the limits. Sometimes it's frightening, sometimes it's exhilarating. But he's constantly on the edge, right? Uh, whereas people who want to be protected, protected in what they think, protected in what they write, people what they say, they, they're not schizo, but they, they just not right in the, the position they occupy in relation to the world. And that's what schizo, schizo is say, relax, don't be afraid, you only have one life, you know, why not do something with it, right? Do something you want to do with it. Do something yeah, you, you have to discover what you want. You have to discover what you want. It's not given. It's only when you do something. You have to do it in order for, 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 the, for the position to, to, be, to be discovered. Right? Nothing is given. Yeah. There's so many strategies yeah. in yeah. the art world and the university. Whatever. Chris? <laughs> hey. Yeah, so there, you said a moment ago um, that schizoculture, schizoculture issue both was and was not about schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And yet schizophrenia was kind of the it disease of that decade. Mm -hmm. It described it perfectly. The artist who Yoi Kusama during the 70s went and checked herself into a mental hospital in Japan where she remained because she thought it would be the best platform for her work. And schizophrenia now is a really object disease. It's a skid row disease, as heavily medicated as possible. I wonder if you could speak to that. Why was it so enlivening then and has such a different meaning now? Because it was, it was a polemic position. You know? The problem is not to lose your head, the, the problem is that you may lose your life if you, if you don't take risks, take chances, take chances uh, of not understanding things, you know, but doing something with things. So the idea of schizophrenia, I mean, of course, schizophrenia is not at all the way people understood here. It, it was part of an analysis of capital. We said that the capital constantly you know, create new flows, you know, the new ways of attracting people, new way of controlling people. But you have to, uh, ad to adhere to some of these flows in order to go somewhere. But it's a dangerous position to take, so constantly you have to oscillate between madness and, 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 and madness, right? So the problem is not to be, to be mad. I mean, of, of course, that's, uh, that's what we have right at the beginning, how to be mad, how to be mad. The problem is not how to be mad, but the problem is uh, you know, how to flirt, to, 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 to surf how to surf with things so that you always kind of have a choice that is not a deadly choice. But better be dead than, than, than just a, 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 zombie, a, a zombie, right? So that, that's, the idea, that's the idea of schizophrenia. And the antithesis of schizophrenia is what they, they talked about anti-dippers, to be framed in the family, to be framed in your, everywhere you go, you know, to, to have to spend your time hitting your head against absent walls. You know, creating the walls for you. See, the neurosis, it's anti-neurotic. It's a polemical position in relation to, to neurosis, fear. Because fear, fear is really what it is. The fear is not something that we inhabit. The fear has been created for us so that we inhabit it. And that was a machine to get out of fear and say, we have a power, we have an energy, we have a creativity. Let's do something without, you know, trying to look what the others think about it and not being restrained by, you know, having to be responsible everything for, for every move you make. Because otherwise, the, the, your move become like repetitive, exactly what is expected. How to, uh, how to not be neurotic, that was it, what it was about, right? So you have to, to, to deal with risks. But if you don't take risks, you don't exist. That's the idea.
Yeah. It seems like, at least recently, there's a Marxist turn in the interest of semi autonomy. You know, mm -hmm. It's not from the communist direction or um, other texts from just a, what would be either um, insurrectionist or left communist ideas. Mm -hmm. ideas. Like, do you, is there a point? Has that always been part of the semi text, or is there a, a certain well, shift? If the Marxists were changing their life, I would be a Marxist. You know, they, they're not Marxist enough. That's what I'm saying. They're not Marxist enough. They, 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 they inhabit careers. They inhabit, you know, I don't know if you, if you look at, um, at, at uh, publicity you receive in, uh, in, in emails. You know, business and politics is one and the same thing. You know, selling your books, selling your conference. Uh, you know, to be a Marxist takes something. Marx was a, was a Marxist. No, but I don't think people are Marxists so much anymore. And we have not shifted towards Marxism. We never left Marxism. We just say, you know, we want to be Marxists, but whenever Marx is with us, whenever Marx is not with us, that's his problem. You know, same way, what we did in 75, that's our problem. We don't have to adhere to everything. You pick up what you want, you know, you're being pragmatic again. You pick up what you want, and Marx was incredibly insightful about society. What we experience now, he, 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 he defined it in advance. You know, it's a, the abstract stage of capitalism, you know, the financialization of everything, the, the semiotization of everything. He knew that, you know, now we, we, we managed to exterminate everything that Marxism were, were based on. But you still have Marxists saying, well, the working class or the workers. What does it mean, the workers? We don't have a working class. A working class had been bought by the system like uh, 50 years ago. It doesn't mean they don't, don't have problems. But, you know, well, all these concepts that come from nowhere, say, we, talk to, we, we talk about the people, but you know. Really but who is the people? Well, yeah. Yeah, but that, that, that's that's a problem of of readers. You see, and I'm glad they do, but they do it for their own reason. What I'm saying that what I liked about the Italians, which we published in 1980 and then again in, in, 19, in 2002 and 2003, right, because no one was interested in them in the meantime, what, what I love them to say, and they were militant, you know, radicals, etc., they said, we are the front of luxury. What does it mean? You can't ask a, a worker who doesn't have the education, who doesn't have the time, to, to predict the future, to, to say something about the future. That has been the big, big mistake of the Marxist. Why is, it, why is it that all the revolutionary came from the middle class or the upper class? Because they had the time to think. When, when Simone Weil went, you know, when Simone Weil went to a factory, she went, but it, it's not that they are middle class that count, it's what they do with it, you know? To be middle class, it's a disappearing race in any way, in any case. But, you know, if, you, if you're just there to, 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 uh, to reinforce your career, money, etc., then you are middle class. Otherwise, you're just a mind. You know, why discriminate between, between people and why go in, in their life to see if Marx had, uh, was fucking his, uh, his maid? You know, who cares? You know, you have to take things that are alive and not criticize, you know. And what I see, I see Marxists coming in our way, but we have budged one inch in relation to that. We were always Marxist, but no one wanted to recognize it. The Marxists hated our guts, and I never, ever attack Marxism, because I'm a Marxist. <laughs> yeah? I have to applaud the one beauty about... That special is one. Is I, I, I agree with you, but hmm? no. I mean, th th this is a, a resenting. A re you know, I mean, I like you, but this is a, a resentment. You know. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. You didn't understand what he was saying. Hold on. You didn't. You didn't hear what he was saying. Oh, 
No, you, you're yeah. talking about some people embracing semiotics yeah. are, and, and, and that they are privileged. And if they were less privileged, they would have more right to embrace semiotics. That's maybe? not what he's saying. Okay, so. Can, can, no, it's not. Can, I mean, that's fine, that's yeah. fine. So, what is it? <laughs> but it's not, that wasn't, I'm saying that. No, but what I'm saying that so, sometimes, you know, also we are not, we're not respons responsible for everything we publish, but we're responsible for everything, right? In other words, we, we don't have to, we don't have to, uh, to be in agreement with everyone, but in as much as what, what the books that we publish touch upon question, issues that are important in a way that for us is, uh, is important, then we publish them. But between them, they don't have to cohere. No, recently, uh, we recently, no, what happened is that we recently published uh, all me, my Italian friends. My Italian friends, you know, uh, took, uh, took the beating for 25 years in order to come up with the books they're coming out now. They were in jail, they were in exile, etc. And they, they are different kind of, different brand of people. They are much more explicitly, they're coming from a workerist Marxist tradition. But it doesn't mean that we have to change our point of view because they, they say that. We are embracing, we're just like a Catholic church, you know, we're embracing the, everything that comes to us. <laughs> right? And I'm sorry if I misunderstood you, I don't hear very well. But yes, it, it may be a problem that, that, uh, that privileged artists uh, like semiotics. It, it's uh, something I've become aware of years ago, and, and that's one of the problems that I have. You know, how can we do it in such a way that we could, we could be part of that, rechannel this energy, but not get caught in it? You know, that's a strategy well, as well, publishers. I mean, but also, like, we are not funded, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, we only survive by the sale of the books. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, totally true. Yeah, so I mean, it's not, I think people think that it's this huge operation, but it's not a huge operation. No, it's a very and, small I mean, operation. it's also a structural problem of education and what? economic uh, violence, you know. So, um, every, there's no, there's no I mean, like, innocent position. No. Yeah, and I mean, and, you know, like, I mean, people in the art world like buy your books because also people in the art world are more adventurous with uh, literature. I mean, like, if you think of, like, mainstream literature, it's not such a great, it's not such a great place at the moment. <laughs> if you, I mean, no, but, like, like, if you read, you know, you read the New York Times book review, I mean, the books are, like, kind of, you know, not so, I mean, like, a lot, of the, <laughs> a lot of the stuff that we like aren't stuff that's printed in huge quantities or whatever. I mean, I'm just saying that's also part of the problem that, we are embraced by the art world the same way experimental film was em embraced by the art world. Wise. What? And music-wise. And music, everything, everything ends in the art world because that's the only place that's left. You, you know, uh, it's, uh, I, I mean, yeah, Carol no, but it's true. Has a question. Yeah.
Jack Smith was beginning, was part of a queer dialogue that had never really been exposed. And I mean, I want to say it out loud. He was gay, <laughs> you know? I mean, he wasn't just talking about a social situation. He was talking about a fantasy about Hollywood. Yeah, and but I mean, his, his fantasy was also because the world that he was in was, you know, really uninhabitable. And exactly. And people were still, you know, I mean, what's like 73 is when the one gay became not a mental illness. When was that? Like the Psychiatrist Association? I think that was in 73. I mean, people were. Yeah. When I was in Berlin, I, I, I talked to someone and he said, look, the situation is simple. You know? In Germany, the theater first is the one that could be political and have a political view of things. Then it switched to film. Then it switched, in other words, uh, and then it switched to the art world. Now, of course, the, the people, the, the world that is the most political is the art world because people, one, have some time to think. You know? Secondly, because they, they, have, they have more time to think because they, they, that's, that's their job. You know? I mean, uh, an artist who doesn't have any idea is not an artist. So what I'm saying is that you, you have some privileged constituencies that keep shifting. And now we are at the art world with the same time the richest, uh, the most privileged, and the more radical. And no one put two and two together. Say, so how come you know, everyone is talking about politics, everything is radical, everything is this, and then they, they are the, the, the most privileged, the most. Yeah, but I mean, know. it's not, I mean, that's just, you, you're talking about like a very small percentage of the art world. I mean, all the, the art world that I know are people who have, I mean, how many artists make, you know, a living? Yeah, yeah, but that's. Yeah, I mean, that's but also. I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about who is privileged or not. I'm just. Sorry? It's a choice. You can be privileged if you want to be. Well, no. <laughs> no, that, that, that's not true. But what, what I'm saying is that what, what, I'm, what I'm saying was not a critique, it was very positive and affirmative. I don't care who has the ideas, but do something with it. And the art world with the idea create a, a class of curators. That's not enough for me, you know, to create a new, a new industry of curating. What school was that? Paris Vincennes. Vincennes. Paris Vincennes. Oh. Yeah. Well, it, it, it was a, a university that was created as far as possible from Paris uh, without being out of Paris. It was a ghetto. It was a ghetto for intellectual, you know. <laughs> and it worked as such. And then it, they took away the, the, the university and that was it. And then May 68 was finished, you know. No, 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 I'm not against, no, I'm not against academia per se, and academia was very important at the time. But they, they went to the world, and the world went to them. And then the, the philosophy had to do with the world, it didn't have to do only with art. And the art, of course, is part of life, but... Hmm? Uh, let's have a final question. <laughs> <laughs> Coming all the way from there. there. Yeah.
Yeah. yeah, I, I hope I understand what you, what you say, but for me, the subject is, is a false problem. Okay? If you see a Nietzsche, Nietzsche said, it's a doing that counts, it's not the being. Being is a, is a fallacy of the verb. When, when you want to, you know, you think of, of being, you think of a subject as something different. You have to cater to your subjectivity. Who cares about subjectivity? Everyone is talking about subjectivity, and no one has a subjectivity because the subjectivity they have doesn't belong to them. That's it. We're creating subjectivities by the gallon, you know, and they don't belong to us. They're being given together with other food, like for the dogs. No, no, it's a false problem. Well, you know, we could publish a Gambin, but uh, we didn't. <laughs> because he's talking about that, like that's what he's talking well, about. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> no, no, th this is a problem. You know, the problem is exactly anticipated by schizo culture. You know, in a schizo doesn't have a subjectivity. He has a world as a sub subjectivity. He goes up and down, you know. He experiences a cosmos and then he can't, you know, he can't open his shoes or something, right? So what we, it was basically that the neurosis is a production of the society, right? In order for us to stay in our couple, in our families, in our job, constantly being repressed and repressing ourselves. Who cares about subjectivity? Who cares about individual? Do something with it, right? And that's what I, I, I object most. Yeah, I don't spend my time in front of a mirror. But individuality, individualist is capitalistic. That's all, you know. And then, and then they, they just just take you, take us one against the other, one away from the other. That's exactly what uh, what uh, what we were saying before. Socialist is to share. We we are trained to compete because we need others in order to know who we are, and for good reasons that we are nothing. If we are nothing, we can be everything. But if we are just a little individual trying to lead his little life and do his little work and have his little affairs here and there, who cares? This is not worth it. That's really what the basic is. That's why better be schizophrenic and confront you know, the elements and, and the world and, and things that uh, can dis distract you to the extent that you're losing your mind. But at least you do something with the world and you do something with you. You're not coming, you know, you don't, you don't see schizophrenic coming with, with a little subjectivity and say, please, please, give me a subjectivity. <laughs> yeah. It's a false problem. I've been saying that for 40 years. It's a false problem. The individual is not a problem. It's something we go with and do something with. But we don't have to be introvert. I mean, that's why I think Jim Fletcher was saying there's like a, there's like a lot of sadomasochism in the schizo culture issue, right? No one has raised that. Well, it was the beginning of this invention, mostly in the gay world, of, of uh, sadomasochism. But sadomasochism is, is present there because it's not neurotic. You have desire, do something about it, right? Experiment with it, experiment yourself. You don't know who you are, but you're not looking to know what you are in order to, to create an image of yourself that you'd like or that you present for others to like and I'll give you a feedback on. Who cares, you know? <laughs> so, uh, Sadomakis was one attempt, American attempt, a creation, you know, a real creation in America to do away with their neuroticism, right? You experiment with it. You, 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 you just can't live because you are so, so made responsible of everything that you want to get out of your skin. So ask someone to help you get out of your skin. Get out of the subjectivity. You know, subjectivity is an impasse. Subjectivity is a false problem. It doesn't mean that there is no subjectivity, but it is something that you have to, to build, to discover, and not let others do for you the quote-unquote construction of subjectivity. Another sentence I love. Thank you so much to everyone. You've been very patient. <laughs> Take care.